Over 2,000 people are reported missing every day. Some go missing under strange circumstances, while others vanish without a trace. This show discusses cases of people who mysteriously disappear and have not been found to this day. This is Disappeared, the podcast series. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of Disappeared, the podcast series. I am your host, Benjamin, and today I am going to get into a case from the 1980s, 1983 to be more specific. This is the case of Tammy Lynn Leppert, and some of you may have heard of this case, especially since it was a pretty famous case for a while, but it has been 33 years since she had gone missing, so... Her case, I believe, has definitely faded from public view, and as a result of that, nowadays, most people have probably not heard of this case. So the elements of this case involves the state of Florida, a possible money laundering operation, a person with no history of psychological problems suddenly becoming highly paranoid, a million dollar lawsuit, a person who won nearly 300 beauty contest crowns, an episode involving the smashing of windows, and the filming of the 1983 movie Scarface, one of my all-time favorite movies. Probably, I would say, the movie that I have watched the most of, of literally any film I have ever seen. I would say the 1986 film Aliens would be a pretty close second, but I believe I've probably seen Scarface more than anything, um, mainly because I've just been watching it for years and years. I'm not one of those crazy people that watches the same movie literally every single day. Honestly, it's really honestly been at least a year since I've seen Scarface, but when I first watched it, it was one of those movies I probably saw 25 times in the first year I watched it. Uh, I was pretty obsessed with that movie for a while. So anyway, let me go ahead and dive right into this case. So Tammy had a very good upbringing. She was born on February 5th of 1965 and grew up in Rockledge, Florida, which is in the Cocoa Beach vicinity. Since she was a young child, she had participated in hundreds of beauty contests winning 280 crowns, to be specific, by the time she was 16 years old. Because she was very attractive and was good at modeling, Tammy decided to pursue a modeling and acting career. The movies she was best known for acting in was the 1982 film Spring Break, a film that I personally have not seen, and of course the 1983 film Scarface. Tammy was the woman who approached Manny's car while he was acting as a lookout in the convertible during the chainsaw scene. So if you've seen Scarface before, the woman in the bathing suit that's leaning into Manny's car, they're they're practically kissing, they're so close together, and he's flirting with her and everything, and she walks off and he goes, Conyo! So anyway, uh, that's her, that's Tammy Lynn Lepper right there. So I thought that was pretty wild. I mean, I'm very familiar with that specific part of the movie, as well as every other second of that movie. Now, going back to the film Spring Break, once filming was completed, Tammy went by herself to a weekend party in celebration of the film's completion. According to friends and relatives, she came back from that party a different person. She became increasingly paranoid, fearing that someone was out to kill her. Tammy claimed to her mother that she witnessed a money laundering operation in Brevard County. This may sound sketchy to some, but think about the atmosphere of Florida during the 1980s. Cocaine, uh, marijuana, and very well possibly other drugs out there were all over the place, and the drug business is a cash business. So I don't believe Tammy was making up this story. After all, she went to a weekend party without any history of paranoia or other psychological issues, and she returned home with a gradually increasing level of paranoia. What I think may have happened is that Tammy was in a house or in a building where this party was occurring, 
she may have wandered off on her own looking for the bathroom perhaps and simply opened the wrong door. She likely observed individuals in a room counting cash or dealing with cash in some other way. When she saw what they were doing, a person in that room probably told her that if she told anyone what she saw in this room, they would kill her. That individual or individuals may have not meant that literally, but they probably just said that so she would keep her mouth shut at the party at least, or after she returned home. Another possibility is that maybe she took a drive with an acquaintance of hers who wanted to quote, show her something and took her to where the money laundering operation was happening. The people involved in this operation might have gotten angry at this person for bringing her along and threatened to harm her if she told anybody about it. And it's likely she never saw any of these people ever again. But those words, we will kill you if you tell anyone, had to have continued to haunt her and just manifest itself in her mind. So this weekend party occurred sometime during or after July of 1982. And when Tammy returned home, she started to exhibit strange behavior. She was living increasingly on edge. Her mom would ask her sometimes what was bothering her and Tammy would just simply say nothing and try to change the subject. At some point, Tammy approached her mom and said to her, what if I told you somebody was trying to kill me? Tammy's mom then took a deep breath and said, do you think someone's trying to kill you? Tammy simply replies back with, yes. As time went on, Tammy spent more and more time in isolation. She was afraid to go out in public and spend the majority of her time at home in her room. She kept replaying those words in her mind over and over, we will kill you, and it began to drive her crazy. Around six to eight months later, in March of 1983, she began filming on the set of Scarface. There was a scene in the movie while they were filming and while Tammy was there on the set where someone was supposed to be shot and blood was supposed to be spurting out of this actor. My guess is that this was most likely at the end of the chainsaw scene when Al Pacino's character, Tony Montana, shot the Colombian drug dealer in the head while they were out there on the street. But I could be wrong about that. I'm just assuming that because Tammy was in that same general scene and Al Pacino's character shooting that person in the street pretty much ended that scene right then and there. And that was the last part of the scene, the last violent part of the scene. Anyway, when this scene was filmed, Tammy witnessed the staged shooting and had a complete mental breakdown on the set. She was hysterical, she was screaming, she was having extreme anxiety, and she had to be taken off set and into a trailer so she could calm down. At the time, this movie was being filmed in Miami, and Tammy was staying with a family friend down there. This family friend got a call from the casting director who explained Tammy's situation on the set. So the family friend picked up Tammy from the set, then relayed the situation to Tammy's mother over the phone. He said that she should consider taking her to a doctor to be checked out and also to have her speak to the police to see if she might be able to talk about why she is exhibiting so much fear and anxiety. So Tammy quit the film and returned home to Rockledge. Once she was home, Tammy's mother insisted that she speak with the police. So Tammy's mother called the police and they came to the house to interview Tammy. During this interview, Tammy never mentioned anything about her life being in danger, nor did she say anything about someone threatening to kill her. The police essentially left empty handed and Tammy's paranoia continued to escalate. According to Tammy's mother, there were times when Tammy was acting completely normal, yet there were other times where Tammy was quote, edgy. Fast forwarding to July 1st of 1983, something set Tammy off and she went ballistic at home. She smashed most, if not all, of the windows in her home and she attacked a family friend who was at the house at the time. This person's name is Wing Flanagan. 
After this episode occurred, Tammy's mom checked her into a mental health facility and Tammy was subjected to psychological evaluations and the testing of drugs and alcohol, which none were found in her system. After 72 hours of observation, Tammy was released from the mental health facility. The next event in the timeline is on Wednesday, July 6th of 1983. This date is the very next day she returned home from the hospital. At 11 o'clock a.m., a male friend of Tammy's picked her up at her home and they planned to take a trip to the beach. On the way to the beach, they began to have an argument, which became more heated as the argument progressed. At some point, Tammy told her friend to stop the car so she could get out. He then pulled into a bank parking lot of an establishment called Glass Bank, which was situated near an Exxon Mobil gas station in the area of State Road A1A between 2nd Street North and 3rd Street North in Cocoa Beach. I have plugged this area into Google Maps and I zoomed in and I had a look at what the area is like today. And I wasn't surprised to find out that there is no bank in this area, nor is there an ExxonMobil gas station in this area either. Right now, there's a place called Jazzy's Mainly Lobster Seafood, uh, another place called the Pig and Whistle English Pub, and a place called Shut Up and Fish. If I were to take a wild guess, just by looking at how these establishments are constructed, it looks like if these businesses are occupying the same buildings that existed in 1983, most likely the Jazzy's Mainly Lobster Seafood would have been the bank parking lot, which would have been the same location where Tammy Lynn Leppert was last seen. There is another place uh, called Shut Up and Fish. It's on the corner of 3rd Street North and North Orlando Avenue, which North Orlando Avenue is also Highway A1A. And I would guess that the Shut Up and Fish establishment may have been the gas station. I'm just honestly just taking an educated guess on that, but that's my assumption. Tammy got out of the car and her friend drove away. This parking lot was located about five miles away from her home it does not appear that they ever made it to the beach. Although she was wearing sandals at the time, she may have not been carrying a purse, although other sources state that she was in fact carrying a gray purse. I must say that there are many reports out there that claim that Tammy was barefoot at the time of her disappearance, which honestly, it's not very relevant either way, in my opinion, whether if she was barefoot or not, but According to charlieproject.org, she was in fact wearing sandals at the time she disappeared. Now, I live in Florida, and I know the climate here very well. Tammy disappeared in the month of July, at some point during the late morning hours, or possibly very early afternoon. Possibly, I would, I would say if she was picked up at 11 o'clock a.m. from her home, she probably was dropped off in the parking lot maybe no later than 11.15. So, for those who live under a rock, Florida gets very hot during the month of July, and naturally the pavement and concrete also becomes very hot, especially in the late morning to early afternoon hours. The parking lot where Tammy was dropped off would have been scorching hot, and she simply would have not been able to stand or walk in that parking lot barefoot. I know this all too well again. There have been countless times where I've visited the beach and tried to cross a parking lot barefoot. I get about four steps into the parking lot before I'm in full sprint to the car. It wouldn't be logical for Tammy to be dropped off in a parking lot barefoot and casually stand or walk around in that parking lot without wearing shoes or sandals. If she was in fact not wearing shoes or sandals, if she really was barefoot, then she couldn't have gotten very far. When she was dropped off by her friend, this was the last time Tammy was ever seen alive. If any witnesses observed Tammy after she exited the car, they have never come forward to speak with authorities. 
it is also unclear if Tammy's actions were caught on the gas stations or the bank's security cameras. Did she use a payphone nearby? Was she picked up by someone else? Or did she simply walk away from the parking lot? If the police has answers to any of those questions, they have not released these answers to the public. Tammy just simply disappeared without a trace. And I have a map in front of me right now of the area where Terry Lynn Leopard disappeared. And of course, this is a modern map. This is a current as of 2017 map. So obviously it's going to look nothing like it did in 1983, but I would have to venture to guess that there are more bridges that access the beach today than the amount of bridges that would have accessed it back in 1983. Now, Highway A1A runs up and down the eastern coast. It makes a turn south over Cape Canaveral. Um, A1A, if you went the opposite direction, it crosses over what's called the Banana River, and it continues inland into the interior of Florida. Now, you go the opposite way where it turns south and it goes across Cape Canaveral, it makes another curve south, and it rides up along the coastline, and it, it rides along it for a good long way. It drives right through Cocoa Beach, but before it arrives at Cocoa Beach, it intersects with Highway 520, which was most likely the highway that Tammy Lynn Leppert and her friend had driven across to get to Cocoa Beach. And A1A continues south through Cocoa Beach, and it keeps going south for several miles until it intersects with another highway called uh, 404, which also crosses the water to get to the interior of Florida, and that connects to Highway 95. It keeps going south for more miles through Satellite Beach, Indian Harbor Beach, intersects with Highway 518 and crosses the Indian River and into the interior. A1A continues south to India Atlantic, and it intersects with Highway 192, again crosses the water into Melbourne, and Highway A1A continues south for uh, a very long way for what looks like 20 miles at least down to North Beach and then to Webasco Beach, which intersects with Highway 510, crosses the water. Then it continues, A1A continues south along the coast, Indian River Shores, then South Beach, which is not Miami, by the way, and A1A looks like it finally makes a turn at the Fort Pierce Inlet State Park and A1A itself crosses the water and intersects with Highway 1. And if you go south, you arrive at a road called Seaway Drive. If you take a left there, you cross the water, you arrive at the coast, and again, it becomes Highway A1A. And just before it arrives at Jupiter Island, it makes a turn west toward the city of Stewart. A1A leaves the beach area it crosses the water over Seawalls Point, and it arrives in the city of Stewart. And A1A looks like it continues to go south from there, but but from that point, you know, if, if Tammy Lynn Leppert was taken down that far, uh, she could have, once she arrived in Stewart, I mean, she could have gone in a million different directions. Anyway, that's, that's the reason I'm reading this. It's mainly because, or, or I'm describing it this way, because... When you're in Cocoa Beach, A1A is the only way in or out of Cocoa Beach. You can either go north up to Cape Canaveral, or you can go south and hit a number of beach communities along the way. So if I were to count, let me see, between Cape Canaveral and where A1A finally turns inland, farther south down the state, there would be 11 bridges that connect the beach to the mainland of Florida. So therefore there would be 11 different possible ways that she would have crossed the water and ended up wherever she would have ended up from Cocoa Beach. That's assuming she ever left Cocoa Beach. I guess technically it's possible somebody could have buried her in Cocoa Beach, but I find that to be very unlikely. I'm sure even in 1983, it was probably very crowded around there, even at night. 
again, I must state that back then there probably were not 11 bridges. There may have only been three or four bridges back in the early 80s, for all I know. I, I simply don't know. But these bridges, especially back then, probably didn't have any cameras or anything like that. I was where I was getting at with this was I was just simply illustrating that Cocoa Beach itself doesn't have a large number of different roads that you could take to go different directions. So if she were abducted, or even if she were to walk away, she would have had to either go north on A1A or south on A1A. Since A1A is the main road that goes down that beach, it must have been a very heavily traveled roadway, especially between 11.15 a.m. and 12 o'clock noon, which would have most likely been the time that Tammy Lynn Leppert would have been spotted by somebody out there. So I find it hard to believe that there wouldn't be any witnesses out there who would have seen her. Now, people probably did see her or take notice, but they probably had no idea who she was. Maybe they were driving down the street too fast and just quickly glanced at her getting into a car or something. But if you turn your head and you just so casually look, glance at somebody who is getting into a car, three minutes, not, not even a minute and a half from then, you're not going to remember that. And if you hear of somebody disappearing in the same area you were driving through, and you hear about this the next day, you're going to replay things in your mind. And even if you didn't see that, you may convince yourself that you did see somebody get into a car. So that's probably why the police generate so many leads, because there are so many people in a general area and they convince themselves that they saw something and they have to contribute in any way they can. And that's probably why tips end up in a big mess of a pile after a certain amount of time. So anyway, let me get back to the case here. Now, at the point Tammy was left in this parking lot and her friend drove away, this is where speculation begins to take over because we simply have absolutely no clue what happened to her as soon as she was dropped off. Her friend drove away and he is the last person that authorities have been able to contact or be contacted from who has ever seen Tammy alive again. So the first thing I want to do is talk about whether Tammy actually wanted to disappear or not. Due to her increased mental instability leading up to the time when she disappeared, she may have decided to just flee the area, flee the city of Rockledge where she was living. She disappeared the day after she was discharged from the mental facility. She may have just said to herself, this is not getting any better. I'm not getting any help from anyone. I don't want to talk to anyone and I just cannot take it anymore. In her mind, she may have left not just for her personal safety, but for the safety of her friends and relatives. Whether she was carrying her purse or not, she must have had money because she acted in a part of Scarface just a few months prior. Surely she was paid for acting in this scene because her role was included in the movie. She also had a minor speaking role, which tends to pay more money in movies. I don't think her conversation with Manny was relevant or even supposed to be audible, but she was speaking in the movie nevertheless. How much money she was paid is unclear, but even if it were just a few hundred dollars, Back in 1983, that would have been plenty enough money to get out of town. If she was not carrying her purse, then perhaps she was a member of the glass bank and withdrew money from that establishment before disappearing. This could be a conflict because if she did go into the bank, they would probably have her on camera. But on the other hand, maybe the police did have this footage, but have not released it to the public for one reason or another. But to me personally, Tammy making herself disappear doesn't make much sense. She was an aspiring actress and of course would not be able to follow a career of acting if she made herself disappear. But over the past year, she saw the world from a different view, a view clouded with paranoia and delusions. She may have long since let go of her dream to be a model and or an actress. Her mom was a modeling agent who probably encouraged Tammy to get out of the house for a few days and take part in the Scarface movie. So, assuming Tammy did make herself disappear, where did she go? 
She always talked about wanting to move to California to pursue a career in acting, but again, if she made herself disappear, she wouldn't be able to act because the public would have recognized her. That being said, she probably did not travel to California. She may have left the country. In this case, she could have traveled to Canada or Mexico, or she may have hitched a ride on a boat or a vessel and left for a Caribbean country or some other Latin country. If this is the case, she could be literally anywhere. But if this, but if this is what happened, then she would likely be alive today. Maybe she never came forward in the years subsequent to her disappearance because her fear of being killed still haunts her. She may be in a region without access to television or the internet, and she may have little to no knowledge of her still active case. Or she may have assumed a new identity and refused to look back to her past. If she did make herself disappear, she could have staged the argument with her friend, starting up an argument just to give him a reason to drop her off somewhere. After he dropped Tammy off, she could have had a friend or a person no one knew about pick her up from the parking lot and take her to a place or to a vehicle where she could begin her new life. From there, she could assume a new identity or, again, could have fled the country. But if she made the decision to leave her home behind and move to another location alone, she might have been abducted along the way. Anyway, another theory I have is that the people who threatened to kill her continued to follow her and occasionally drive by her home. On the days that she became increasingly paranoid, Perhaps she was in contact with these individuals who threatened her life, or she may have noticed that she was being watched by them. This would validate her reasoning for having breakdowns and never wanting to leave her home. At some point prior to her disappearance, she began not wanting to eat food that was prepared for her and drink from containers that were already opened, out of fear that she would be poisoned. If she were met by these individuals after that weekend party, they may have planted that idea in her mind if she talked to anyone. When she came home from the filming of Scarface and spoke to the police, these individuals may have driven by her house and observed police cars in her driveway. Or they may have been tipped off that police were at Tammy's house. Following the police interview, Tammy may have once again been approached by these individuals and they may have threatened her once again. This could have put her over the edge and caused her to smash the windows in her home and attack the family friend, Wing Flanagan. Following this episode, she was sent to the mental health facility. The individuals who threatened her would have learned that she was under psychiatric observation. This may have caused them to become paranoid themselves, in fear that she would speak with mental health professionals about the truth behind her situation. Mental professionals who were obviously experts at surfacing information buried in people. She was discharged from the hospital and returned home. The very next day was the day she disappeared. It seems likely to me that she was abducted by the people who previously threatened to kill her. And if they made contact with her after that weekend party, that would further validate her episodes of going crazy. These money launderers may have been following her on the morning she disappeared. They observed her exiting her friend's car in the parking lot and saw the perfect opportunity to capture Tammy. From there, they may have actually killed her or they may have taken her to another location and she could be anywhere today. But this possible abduction took place 33 years ago. I doubt she would still be held in captivity today. That would make Tammy 51 years old today and her captors would, of course, be 33 years older as well. I think it is more likely, if she was abducted by money launderers, they murdered her shortly thereafter. Now, money can buy a lot of influence, especially in the state of Florida during the 1980s. And that brings me to my next point. These money launderers could have had police officers in their pockets. It is possible that the police may have assisted in Tammy's disappearance. I find that scenario to be pretty unlikely, but it is a possibility. This could explain why Tammy refused to tell the truth to the police who interviewed her at her home. She may have even seen these same officers being involved with the money laundering operation. Naturally, if this is true, of course she would not talk to the police. 
maybe the money launderers told her they bought police influence, so taking her story to the police would not be of any help to her. It would only get her killed. And now on to the next point. She may have also been the subject of a random kidnapping. Being frustrated from the argument she had with her friend, she may have approached another individual in the parking lot and asked for a ride. That individual may have been the person that abducted Tammy. In this case, she could have been taken anywhere, but would likely be deceased today. It really is unfortunate that the public is unaware whether Tammy was caught on camera in the parking lot where she was last seen. Now, this next theory does not explain how she disappeared, but it may shed some light on this weekend party she attended. Perhaps she stumbled into a room where this money laundering operation was occurring, and she was actually kidnapped during this weekend. Her captors may have decided to let her go after agreeing that kidnapping and possibly killing an innocent person was bad for business. They would let her go, but not before telling her that they mean business and they will kill her if she talks to anyone about the events of that weekend. Maybe another possibility was that Tammy could have seen an actual murder during that weekend party she attended, and perhaps that gave her a level of post-traumatic stress. And later, when she was filming on the set of Scarface and she saw that person shot, that may have been a major trigger for her, and that was what led to her breakdown. So that is a possibility that I would not rule out. The next element is a plausible theory that the police have, and it is that Tammy became a victim of the serial killer Christopher Wilder. So Wilder was focusing on models during the time he was active, and Tammy was a model. But one inconsistency is that Wilder did not start killing people until one year after Tammy disappeared. But that doesn't necessarily mean that Tammy wasn't Wilder's first victim, though. He may have abducted Tammy after recognizing her and later killed her. If Tammy was his first victim, perhaps her being a model contributed to his desire to prey upon other models during his subsequent killing spree. However, that may not be the case because Wilder raped a young woman prior to 1983 by luring her into a false pretense of modeling. Tammy's family eventually filed a lawsuit against Wilder for the sum of a million dollars, but this case was later dropped, probably due to Wilder being killed by police in April of 1984, which would have been less than a year after Tammy was abducted or went missing. Wilder conducted his killing spree from February to April of 1984. It is confirmed that Wilder killed at least eight victims and is suspected of killing several others. Now get this, believe it or not, Wilder left a personal estate worth more than $7 million when he died. He was apparently a gifted real estate person. I don't remember if he was a developer or what he was in real estate, but he was pretty successful at doing so. Fortunately, his estate, after taxes, was divided between the families of his victims. Although Wilder is not known to have begun killing until after Leopard disappeared, he is suspected of killing five other women prior to Tammy Lynn Leopard's disappearance. In the year following Tammy's disappearance, Wilder killed four models and aspiring models in Florida alone. Wilder was living in Florida at the time Tammy disappeared, but he was living in Boynton Beach, which is located 143 miles away from Rockledge. His killing spree stretched across Texas, Oklahoma, Colorado, Nevada, California, and New York. He went all over the country killing people. He was later killed in New Hampshire by state troopers. There is another person of interest in Tammy's case, who was a man by the name of John Crutchley. This person is known as the Vampire Rapist. He's not a person that I'm familiar with, partially because he committed his crime so long ago and was jailed soon after, but this person is suspected of killing as many as 30 women. However, which I found kind of odd, he was never formally charged with any murders. At the time Tammy disappeared, Crutchley was living in Palm Bay, which is located just 27 miles away from Rockledge. Given the proximity of Crutchley and Wilder, Crutchley was more likely to have abducted Tammy. 
So anyway, those are the possibilities that I laid out for Tammy Lynn Leopard's case. If there is a scenario that you can think of, or if I left out a theory that you know of, feel free to leave me a comment below. Or you can send me your comment to disappearedseries at gmail.com. Here are my final thoughts on this case. My conscience tells me it is probably not this scenario, but my gut tells me that this is what happened to Tammy. I believe that when she was dropped off at the parking lot, individuals who were keeping a close eye on her took their opportunity to abduct and silence Tammy by killing her. Due to her paranoia and seclusion, her abductors likely had little to no opportunities to abduct Tammy prior to her official disappearance. Because this weekend party occurred nearly a year before she was kidnapped, I find it unlikely that she was under constant surveillance by these money launderers. I believe police visited Tammy's home to interview her. The money launderers learned of this encounter with police, possibly by the police themselves. The subjects took it upon themselves to watch Tammy closely from this point. When they discovered that Tammy was admitted to a psychiatric hospital for observation, they decided that enough was enough, and the day after she was released from psychiatric care, they abducted her while she was alone in the parking lot. My guess is that when she was left in this parking lot, an associate of these money launderers approached Tammy by car or by foot and offered her a ride back to her house. He may have told her that he overheard her fighting with her friend and would be happy to take her home. Perhaps he said he was going the same direction where she lived after he asked her where her house was. She then agreed to the offer, she got into his vehicle, and they abducted Tammy. From there, they took Tammy to a distant secluded area where they killed her and disposed of her body. I assume that she was buried which explains the fact that no trace of her body has ever been found. So that's everything I have on the Tammy Lynn Leopard case. I provided a link to Leopard's missing flyer below, as well as other links relating to the case. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Disappeared Series, for future episodes. Also be sure to visit my new website at disappearedseries.weebly.com for information on all my episodes. Thank you very much for listening, and until next time, stay safe out there.